Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Hobby Hangout here, October 11th, 2019. Uh, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I am the one of the physical engineers here at Privateer Press, making all these really cool minis that we see here. Uh, today, I am joined by my guest host, Tanner. He's just off camera over there. We've also got Tony Konacek. Good morning. Where's my, there's my mic. Yep. Look at that. I wasn't Tanner, ready to go. In. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, there we go. Um, now, today we're going to be cleaning the uh, order of illumination vigilance unit. We've got them all right down here. But before we get started, we've got a few announcements. Uh, so we got our stream schedule here. Uh, October 14th, in, yep, October 14th, uh, starting at 10 a.m., we've got our staff showdown going on. What do we... Uh, do we know what's uh, going on that one yet? Sorry, I'm like super loud over here. That's uh, that's next Tuesday. We got Lauren and Faye playing a game of War Machine. So we're going to see some oh, Infernals man. versus some Signar, and I believe we're going to be seeing some Archons on the table, too. That should Ooh, be a good one. Nice, nice. And then uh, October 25th, again at 10 a.m., we've got another Hobby Hangout. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I believe that's going to be Danny doing another, uh, another kit project. Oh, I'm so excited to see what he's doing. I saw his uh, little Elmo Warjack. Um, Doc, I yes. understand. That was, was very, cool. So yes, very cool. That was so cool. All right. Um, and then we've got subscriptions. Uh, we've got some new recently unlocked emotes. We got uh, Chibi Ashlyn there. And I freaking love that as a pin. Like, that was one of my favorite pins that we were doing back then. Um, and we are currently at 95 subs. Um, 100 subs is we get to unlock a new pin. And it is the Monster Apocalypse Donut Factory. Right. Ooh. And Can't if you're yeah, if you're not aware, if you have uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you get one free subscription with uh, Twitch Prime. So yeah, go ahead and super subscribe easy. to us for a month. Yeah. So use it on us. Yeah, please. Uh, and I'm really hoping the donut factory has like little googly eyes above the donut hole, so it, it, it can actually use it for some sort of a. Yeah, they better get on it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But I don't know what it looks like. Yet. That is an iconic Monpoc building, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so next up, we've got our mini crate models. So the L5R mini crate, we've got the new one, uh, Akoto Totori, coming out November 5th. Oh, no, uh, it's oh. already, it's out now. Oh, it's out yep. now. And then oh. uh, you subscribe by November 5th to oh, get the mini. My bad. Uh, that is a super cool model. I love the ar intricate armor on that one. And then we've got our Savage mini crate. It is the last week to order Belit. And have to subscribe by tomorrow to get by that tomorrow, really yeah. cool model. Yeah, Jordan and I uh, painted up uh, Belit yesterday on Get Your Paint On uh, during our dual painting. If you haven't already seen it, they did a little section on skin tone blending that was really interesting. Ooh. <clears throat> All right. So uh, right in front of me here, we've got our Order of Illumination Vigilance. Um, little guy that I got here who's kind of, well, girl lady. Um, she's tinted blue. Uh, something that I was noticing from my last stream is it was a little hard to see some of the stuff on screen. So I tried just uh, using a little bit of our uh, blue wash and um, mixed with some alcohol just to kind of create some contrast here. Um, does that help at all? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, when you yeah. hold it up like that. Oh, yeah. Let's get it centered. Yeah. So I figured that was something that we could try to just get a little better shot of things. Um, so which one do you think we want to start off? We've got hat guy, uh, hood guy, and the I think this is the leader of the unit. Yeah, I think you made an interesting point when you said that the leader is a good place to start because yeah. she has that attachment point in the center of the body. Yeah, it's kind of a neat little joint that we've got here that nicely hides the, the seam. So we're going to start there. A um, couple of tools that I'm going to be using today. Uh, first one is a little rotary tool that I've got here. Yeah, there we go, on camera. Um, this is something that all of us in the back here use religiously for cleaning. Um, not every hobbyist needs it, but we find that they save like hours upon hours upon hours of cleaning. Um, It'll change when, your life, especially if you work oh on yeah. a lot of metal parts. When is a, so, so when would somebody want to think about getting a, a rotary cleaner? Um, if they're willing, if they want to save themselves a lot of time, uh, if they're doing full units of things, it's a big, big, big deal. Uh, or even if they're wanting to do something like a larger model, uh, this okay, thing yeah, yeah. will eat mold lines. Like just 
shave them off, eat them for breakfast. Can you and, do you mind putting your hand behind that tip and just making sure that it's oh okay yeah, yeah. And let people see what that uh, what that looks like? Yeah, yeah. So um, if anybody remembers my last stream here, our last episode, I was using this little guy here for. Uh, it's basically the same tool. It's just instead of putting it in the pin vise, it's putting it in a rotary tool right, right. where it's actually meant to go. But um, yeah, it works great on there. And uh, we're going to start off just by taking a look at the model. Um, what I like to do whenever I'm cleaning a miniature is I will always start off by choosing a start point. And then the way that the models are laid up in the molds it's kind of like two little pancakes coming together and the miniatures in between it. And there's always going to be like this mold line that goes all the way around the model. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Hands, hands behind and that'll help. It's hard to hold it like it. that. Yeah. But yeah, um, so it's always coming all the way around the model. And if you can find a point to follow on that, it's, you can just follow the line all the way around and you'll have a nice clean miniature. And, chances are you're going to have a harder time missing a mold line. So I think where I want to start off here is actually right in the, right up in here. Uh, there's this little vent piece that's uh, coming off here. And it's um, kind of blocking a little bit of the uh, joint there. So that way we can uh, get that clean and have the top half of the part sitting nice and easy. And what is the shape on that grinding tip that you got there? Is that one of the ones that's conical, or does it have a little ball at the tip? Oh, no, no. This one's just a little rat tail, so it comes to a nice little point and uh, super nice and sharp. What I like to do with it is um, a lot of the times when I'm cleaning, and let's just get this guy going here. All right. So when I'm using the rotary tools, um, I am using them on a very, very low speed. Tony, let me know if that's too loud or chat, anybody? Um, but I always use it at a very low speed because what ends up happening is um, if you go too high, it has a real tendency to just bite into the part and uh, dig away at it. So a nice low speed means you can just kind of like use the side there and just bite it off nice and easy, get a nice smooth thing. And what I'm using is I'm using the side of the rotary tool, not the tip or anything. And just kind of following that mold line around. Now I'm going to come around this side here and now what I've got here too is a little bit of the gate I think that is uh, digging in there. So what I'm going to have to do is we'll shut this off for half a second. And what I like to do is just take a little 15, 15 blade here and uh, trim away some of the excess stuff so I don't have to use the rotary tool to remove the big, chunkier material. If you don't have a rotary tool like Brian's got there, <clears throat> but you've got yourself a basic set of sculpting tools, real thin mold lines like this. You can scrape away pretty fairly with the edge of that. Yeah, I'll show that off uh, a little bit here too. And hopefully with this uh, staining that I did on here, it'll show and really amplify areas that I've uh, cleaned up. I think the coloring definitely makes it a little easier to see. Yeah. So can, let's see, we can lock in the focus. Yeah, let's, let's just go do that. We're trying to get this, but it's really tricky to. Yeah. All right. And I'll just have to use uh, the palette cam over there for, for anything. So we just got this little area here. We'll just. So what I'm actually doing for a lot of uh, cleaning is I'm not cutting. Come Come down just a little bit. Sorry. There you go. Uh, I'm not actually cutting the part, like, kind of going in like this. What it is, a lot of it is just using the blade going uh, parallel to things, and it's more scraping away at things. And what I'm often doing is the mold line's coming kind of like this. Just imagine the, the blade is the mold line, and my finger is the blade. What I'm doing is I'm, rather than going 
along the mold line like that, what you want to do is kind of go and feather it this way, kind of across the mold line, because that'll help um, not remove too much material. And it'll almost just help it peel off really smoothly, as opposed to kind of scraping it away. Yeah. And come back down just a little bit. Sorry. OK, sorry, I was like, I missed a second. We were just trying to dial in some of the tech because it was a little, little bright under that light. And so now I think we can see a little better. OK, there we go. And I want to say thank you to Dragon Pup and Vandebeast for resubbing Ooh, in October. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for being awesome viewers. <laughs> Silent clap. Yeah, so again, just using the blade here just to kind of scratch away at things. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, I can see there. Yeah. So you can see the mold line kind of comes around here off this edge of the cloak and goes down this flat face here. Yeah, that would be a, might be a tricky spot to get with like a, the half round file, which is basically all I use. For, yeah, yeah. A lot of people just use things. like the really big flat files, but yeah. I almost never use them. Uh, yeah. They're just too big and clunky to get into anywhere. So I'll just use uh, my little hobby knife here or um, these guys here, just a little pin vise with the rotary tool tip. Again, it's the uh, little diamond head that's on there, mm -hmm. super smooth. And what I'll do is just kind of go in and yeah, just kind of scrub it away. One of the things I like to think of is just using it like a giant eraser and just erasing the mold lines. So if you can't see well, uh, this tip that he's got on there essentially has a metal ball on the end with stippling in it. And when it rotates, that grinds away pieces. Yeah. And is the, is the ball free floating on the tip? Like it actually no, no, no. rotates? No, it's fixed. No, it is uh, locked into the pin vise, so it is okay. not rotating okay. at all. It is one giant piece. Now, when I'm doing this here too, is you want to do really small little circles, and you don't want to do too much pressure. If you go too much pressure, what it'll do is you'll have all these giant uh, scratches in the pieces that um, will show up when you put paint or anything on there. If you're doing small little circles and you're doing them in with a nice light pressure. It takes a little bit more work, but you'll get a nice smooth surface that won't have anything. So you're almost using that when it's in the pin vise as a filing tool, whereas yeah. when it's in the rotary tool, it's more of a grinding or cutting implement. Exactly, yeah. That's fascinating. That's also the same advice I give my children when they're brushing their teeth. Oh, yeah? Tiny little circles. Tiny little circles. Small pressure. What's that song? Clean like brush, uh, brush. Uh... <laughs> Might have been before my time. Oh. I'm too old. So there we go. Uh, which Dremel tip exactly? Um, I don't remember what the name of them was. I just found them on a website somewhere many, many years ago. Um, but it is the super fine rounded uh, ball tip. And then I've got the, uh, again, just the super fine diamond tips. Um, are some of the best ones to get. And you can just, they'll have examples of the tip and they're just the super, super tiny ones. Often. And you can, can you, uh, towards the ether, wanted to know where you get tips for that tool. Is that just something that you can pick up at like any box store, hardware store? Uh, yeah, I, I picked up uh, this specific set somewhere online. I, I can't remember the exact website, but it was just searching um, rotary tool uh, tips. Um, and there's various tips, uh, things that you can do for that. Uh, but I did also have, like, I'll just give a quick little pan of my, like, I've got tips all over the place, different. Uh, <laughs> tips for days. Tips for days. A bunch of different collets. So that, throw those under the, uh, under the pallet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got that, too. But yeah, um, different collets for the different uh, diameter so I can put like anything from these really fat guys in there. I think these are the standard ones that just came with it down to some of these more specific ones that I picked up online or at the hardware store. Um, yeah, you can fit just about any in there. It's just a matter of doing a little quick Googling. In my experience, when it comes to buying bits like these, 
you can get them in virtually three varieties. And a lot of the times, rotary tool companies will make their own bits. That's one variety. You can also get ones that are intended for jewelry. That's another variety. And you can also get ones that are intended for dental work. Yeah. I haven't um, played with yeah, all of people, them yet. People have been mentioning uh, dental picks in here as well. And oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I've got... That uh, you use. I got a bunch of these right over here, too. If and you have hand sculpting tools or do any hand sculpting, you should definitely have dental picks in your sculpting ab set. Absolutely. But uh, that's actually another tool that I'll use um, for a little bit rougher work. Let's see if I can find... Yeah. Uh, right down at the bottom side of the cloak here, you can see this little darker area. Now, it's hard to see specifically on camera here because I can't quite get that close. Uh, but that is a little bit more of a shift line. Um, basically, that's caused when the two halves of the mold aren't coming together perfectly, perfectly. Um, Tanner, what are some of the reasons that the you get shift? Like, what causes that in metal so miniatures? When it comes to metal miniatures, um, well, when it comes to any miniatures, the parts that we make are all a little different. They're different sizes, different volumes, and different shapes. So when we're casting metal, we have to play with the spin speed, the heat, and the pressure of our casting machines and our metal to get the best results for every part. So if you're running multiple molds at once and trying to find a good balance of settings to run all of those parts, uh, sometimes you know there might be a little less pressure than is ideal for a certain part pressing the mold together, which is gonna leave you with a little bit of space where that liquid metal is gonna seep into. But generally, these models are laid up in the mold in such a way where that shift line isn't gonna be through any kind of major detail, so it should require minimal work to kind of scratch that stuff away. It should be mostly on flat surfaces because that's the way we set those in the mold. Yeah, and like this one here, it's not particularly bad at all, uh, but it is right underneath a cloak area where you're not really gonna be seeing a whole heck of a lot with it, so. Now that's, that's something that, um, that engineers and, and try to plan for when making, or, um, and the mold makers plan for when laying up the miniature is putting mold lines in places that are less visible or even like lining them up with like the edge of a cloak or something so that if they show up that they're nearly invisible or at least like yeah. way less obvious. That's one of the most integral parts of their job. And then that also uh, comes down to... Come down a little bit, Brian? When the mold is being cut and where it's being cut. Yeah, the uh, guys who do the layups and stuff like that really have their work cut out for them when determining where to put a mold line. Um, it's like, obviously, you try not to put them over a face if at all ever possible. Uh, they're always thinking about, like, not going over some rivets or anything. But uh, the other thing is, like, okay, they can, they got to try and figure out, like, do we want a mold to last a long time or do we want it to make, like, one or two pulls before it is just completely no good anymore? Right. So again, you heard it here first. Our sculpts are too detailed for modern technology. <laughs> yes. Sometimes. Like, there's, there have been some parts where it's just like, we don't know where we're supposed to feed this or vent this because there's detail all over this staff. <laughs> yeah, it's how do we break it up? How do we lay this up? Yep. So you can see all the uh, extra powder that I'm getting built up on here. That's just material that's being ground away. Uh, Chewy8 is saying, what tool is he using? Uh, Chewy, uh, we talked about it a little bit before, um, but it is a, uh, a rotary tool with a diamond tip file inserted in it. So it's, uh, Brian's actually using the rotary tool to do the, the grinding. So I'm just cranking up the speed a little bit just to kind of get a little bit more bite as I'm going. And again, just Swiveling around on the tip there to try and get that uh, shift line out of there. You can see this area here is already pretty much gone. Yeah, I can see where it ground away. Now, I, like I'm looking at this again, as I said before, you know, when I in my hobby career of of cleaning miniatures, I've only ever used clippers, an exacto knife, and the the standard set of files. Um, that most of us have and it seems 
that using this tool is not only maybe more effective, but also less stressful. Oh yeah, it's actually really fun too. Like you get the, like the just nice little vibration from it is kind of easing on the hand. Um, the little drone of it, you just kind of like tone it out and you can just kind of like sit mindlessly, go away, like go to town cleaning up a miniature. And some of us uh, in the mold shop that are cleaning metal masters and stuff like that, like we do this for hours and hours and hours and hours every right. day and yeah. we just sit and clean miniatures yeah i'd imagine it's a little easier on your hand too having the machine do a little bit of the work for you yeah especially like uh, this is not the actual machine this is like a little extendable wand wand um so it's a little lighter on the hands it's actually like conformed to my grip a little bit better and it allows you to hang up the actual tool so you're not holding that weight the whole time yeah as long as you're not trying to hang it on your camera boom and everything like that to cause vibrations and stuff. My favorite thing about it is I can't count how many times I've been working on a custom piece and end up diving a razor blade straight into my thumb. Oh, oh yeah. And that that's not going to happen with one of these. Uh, uh, it, it might. Um, actually, perhaps, perhaps the results won't be as bad. Yeah, probably not. But the other nice thing about these guys here too is um, the different tips that you can get. Like this one here is for really good fine uh, fine work, like chewing up a mold line or whatever. Um, when we were working on your uh, Beast 09, Beast 09 um, we had to, well, what was the torso on that? Was that the actual Beast 09 torso or was yeah, that Yeah, so it was the Beast 09's upper torso section and we cut straight through the actual shoulders of it to pre pre preserve the original shoulder pieces and the cowl with the lettering that goes around his head. And we cut through that whole metal chassis to preserve those parts, so we could make an original or have those original parts on the. Yeah, conversion. what we ended up using was uh, something kind of like this. Very heavy grinding bit. Yeah, very, very, very heavy grinding bit. Um, it just chewed right through it, and again, just same tool, super easy, and has multiple applications. Uh, if you're doing any super major hobbying or anything like that, it can be pretty good for it as well. Oh, and something to note, if you're playing with one of these, we didn't go over this already, wear safety glasses. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> safety glasses. Come down nice. a little lower, Brian? Huh? Come down a little oh, lower. In the my front. bad. I'm, I'm really bad about that. So uh, we got this. This is coming down here. So we got a question here in chat um, about how this tool works on plastic and resin compared to metal in your experience. Uh-huh. Um, when I'm using, I don't really like using it on plastics a whole lot because what it ends up doing is the heat and friction from the rotation of it Melted. tends to m melt the plastic ever so slightly and then it's like gums up your bits a lot more. Um, it tends to gour a lot for the plastic. So you have like those little frills just right, coming off and yeah. it ends up making everything look furry and gross and stuff. Uh, when I'm doing plastics, um, either the hard plastics or the soft plastics um, for anything, I'll often just use a hobby knife and like my little scraper tools and stuff like that. I don't really use the rotary tool. Now when I'm using the tool on resins, um, I was actually, was I? No, I didn't bring it in last time. Um, I will use it with a dust mask on and I will use it as a very high speed because it doesn't really bite into it. It just chews through it like butter. And like you can do some really fine cleaning with it. And then all you have to do after you do like the rough work with it is go in with a little bit of fine sanding paper, like sandpaper or an emery board or something like that. Uh, cool. Cleans up super easy. So we got a little bit of flash going on here. And, so oh. If you do go and get uh, that plastic or resin gunk up in your files, what's your preferred method for cleaning them off? Uh, take like a little wire brush, um, like a really, really fine wire brush, and just give it a light little uh, scrape or brushing, and that usually gets it cleaned out. Um, if it's something really fine, like your uh, fine diamond tip files, I'll often just use a little bit of alcohol um, with a really coarse toothbrush and just scrub at it that way and that usually gets them cleaned out i haven't really ever blown out a file so uh like a rotary tool uh i have ruined a few set like of the old school files that i used to you know the really big long ones mm. like 
for that are usually used for miniatures. Um, I have blown out a few of those just by getting them all gunked up with like super glue or like resin or whatever. And it's just not worth the hassle of fixing them half the time. Gotcha. My preferred method is uh, blasting them with a blowtorch, which is a little less sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one might actually end up tempering your tools. So, got this little uh, rim down on the bottom here. Oh, yeah, I can kind of see it ridged out. Oh, come up on the camera a bit. No, oh, okay. Yeah, I am so bad about that. It's so, tough. Like, you're trying to get this, this fine detail and be able to look at it and get the tool in yeah, there. Yeah, one of the, the real camera's parts limiting is where you like, can be. I'm going to come off, off here, but like, when I'm usually working at things, I'm working at them like literally inches from my nose. And I've got like a halogen lamp kind of a thing right above that I'm almost putting my forehead on. And I'm doing it at that distance. So having to come, come at it from a camera and keeping it on screen is quite the different experience than still trying to pick that one up. So Tony, I guess the question is, why don't you have a full studio here for Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. This studio got bigger than, uh, than the old building. Oh, if we want to expose ourselves to everything that goes on all the shenanigans out in the warehouse. We should just bring the camp, do a handheld. Just do it right yeah, at just, uh, just right at your right, station. Yeah, right at my desk. All right. So the mold line again here. It's uh, trying to follow. It's pretty close, uh, right along this cam or this uh, edge here. And we'll just go and give that a quick little scrape. Again, like this is. Uh, bottom facing, so I'm not particularly like I, I like to get a little bit lazy when I'm doing things. And it, if I know that something is underside of an armor plate or uh, the backside underneath like an elbow or something, and we're never going to see it, I'm way less fussy when it comes to actually cleaning those on my own miniatures. I'm the worst, like, I'll uh, paint things in pieces so I can make sure I paint under cloaks and between legs and under the armpit and play behind shields, places no one will ever see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when I was doing a ret army um, a few years ago, I ended up having to paint every single piece um, before I assembled anything because I was doing a a stenciling by pulling a loofah over the material, like over the parts, and then airbrushing it after that, so I could create like this like geometric stencil pattern over it that looked kind of like camouflage. Oh right, was that? Were you talking about the one with the loofah where it was like the hex pattern? Yep. Oh yep. yeah, that's yeah. the one. That was beautiful. Yeah, but oh, I hated doing that because like all the really weirdly curved plates on the red army was just like on the red armor was just... Yeah, you're trying to effectively lay a stencil over that. Yeah, it was really And do tricky. it with an airbrush, which is super wet. Oh, yeah, and then juggling <laughs> all these parts just with two, like, two hands as I'm trying to hold it all and then airbrush it before it shifts. Little known fact, if your miniature doesn't fall out of your hands during the most integral part of gluing or painting, then it didn't actually happen. Oh, don't remind... <laughs> <laughs> when I was first getting into it, um, I put up, or I was doing the Harbinger of Menoth, and I had spent so long putting that miniature together. And if anybody's seen Harby, uh, Harbinger, she has got chains everywhere, and she's just free floating and everything. I painstakingly cleaned this model, put her together. I go out to the garage because that's what I had to do at the time, and I go to primer, and I didn't know any better at the time. And I just had her sitting on my box, like a little spray box, and I didn't have her secured down quite as well as I thought I did. And the second I go to start priming, psh, and she just it falls, falls right, right onto the concrete. And it was just like slow-mo, her just like smooshing on the ground. And it's just like, you look at it, kick the box next to you, and then just scoop it up back inside. Yep, back to the drawing board. Yep. I was uh, helping a friend paint his Riot Quest Boom Howler a few weeks ago, and like he was just finishing up the details on his mohawk, the very last part, and then he drops him straight on his head and bends the mohawk. Oh, no. Uh, I felt so bad for him. Oh. I did that bringing in a handful of models that I had prepped uh, for our painting jams recently and uh, had 
had them at home and picked them up in the morning and they needed to be in for paint jam that day and then just picked them up to take them out in the car and then instantly fell out of my hands the whole box and everything smashed. Why drop the ball when you can drop the miniatures? <laughs> <laughs> I removed her flagpole and replaced it with a two mil- millimeter pinning rod. Yup, yup, that's, that's what I ended up having to do with her too. Speaking of that Beast 09 that you helped me with, yep. right after it, because I painted it in parts like I was saying, and I went to do some drilling and put it together and put a pin in his, in his waist, and the drill caught the model at a weird angle and ripped it out of my hands and bent his axe, no. and I had to touch the paint up. I, was, I almost had a freak out. Uh, so something that I'm doing right here is there's a little bit of a mold line that goes down from uh, the cloak here down to the bottom of the foot. And what I'm end up ending up doing is I'm actually just taking that mold line and just kind of like working with it. Sometimes there's a part where it's just like, it's not coming out exactly smoothly. You just kind of got to deal with it and work with it. And what I'm ending up going to end up doing here is just kind of like creating a bit of a divot there and then creating a, the same effect as some of this leather that's going on in the foot. Like it's uh, just one of those natural like little valleys in the, uh, in the leather boot. So, so, so you're, you're mimicking the sculpt a bit when you do this. Yeah. I mean, it's my miniature at this point. Right. Like make it mine a little bit like some of these little tiny details is just uh hiding or you know blending in things it's kind of like uh, bob ross with his happy little happy little mistakes see that's awesome because when i again when i do this uh i end up just using the finger cross technique i'm just like i hope nobody sees where i gouge that model apart right mm-hmm. down there on the foot yep and if you can figure out a way to Hide that if you want to. You can go in with a little bit of uh, putty and fix it up if you're really a stickler for it. But a lot of the times it's easier just to like, we'll just uh, make that look like leather or, oh, there's a, it's battle damaged armor where yep. I, you know, slipped with a drill and. Mud, <laughs> mud and rust are I your best friends. I have a feeling friends. a lot of battle damage you see on models are uh, not intentional battle damage when they started. <laughs> So again, coming around the bottom, I'm not particularly fussy. Got that here. And we got a nice little shift line here. So what I'm going to end up doing is, and this is going to be really awkward trying to keep this on cam, (laughs) is coming at it like this. And what I'm going to do is just shave off like this raised area down on the bottom here. Is this actually showing? Really nicely. All right. So we're just going to shave it off and kind of take it down and then feather it out to the raised area here. Something I really like about this unit of models is a lot of the time footwear on models is just effectively basic leather boots with maybe like a shin guard or something like that. Yeah. I like that these have a little ring on the side with the three leather straps. It's just a little more interesting detail on something that's generally very plain across a lot of miniatures. Oh, these models have so much detail. Like they're, uh, what is the, does anybody here know what the... Um, their symbol is the little starburst Morrowind symbol. Is it the same as the... The Order of Illumination symbol. Is, it, is there a name for that? I'm not sure. I don't actually... Yeah, I don't know if there's a I, name for the symbol itself. I thought there was, but I don't remember. It's been a while since I've... Come down a little so bit. So what there. I've done here is I've just uh, switched over to my rounded rotary tip. Um, it's just a little bit better for getting into that little nook and cranny with the cape and then again just using the blade there I was able to get rid of some of the major material and then come in and work out the fine material with the rotary tool And so how fast, Brian, on a normal day, if you were going to go through a unit of metal miniatures, how, how quickly can you get through a unit? Um, 
I mean, if I'm doing it for uh, my own personal use, I could probably get a full unit done in four hours ish. Okay. Uh, again, like I'm a little lazy sometimes. I'll just ignore some of the areas. Um, I'm a real fussy person when it comes to finding mold lines. I will point somebody's mold lines out when they show me painted miniatures. It's like you missed a mold line. You missed a mold line. Here's a mold line, and I'll find them. Like. I, I yeah, but, I, def- yep. I want that over my shoulder. Like at first, it'll drive me crazy because. But you were like eh, four hours, and that's if I'm being lazy. And I'm like, it's thirty minutes for me. But that's, I mean, the yeah. standards and ability levels are are completely I, I also, different. I, like I, I don't really paint miniatures a whole lot anymore. Um, I just don't have a whole lot of time. I've got other things going on. But I love the hobby side of things right. still. So all. I'll do kit bashes, um, yeah. just cleaning miniatures. Again, it's just something that I really love doing. Yeah. It's also, um, you know, I've met a lot of hobbyists um, who actually don't enjoy putting miniatures together. Like, they love doing really? the painting part and making them, but they don't like building. And I'm like, I, that's so, uh, I love painting, but there's this weird thing that happens when I'm done building a kit and then it's time to paint. I'm almost sad that like, I don't have all the parts to put together. I love building kits. I've heard that opinion a lot lately, too. People saying that their least favorite part of miniatures is the assembly portion, mm-hmm. which I never really agreed with. I personally find it to be one of the less labor-intensive parts of yeah. it. Painting, on the other hand, I love it and have been doing it for a very long time, but it's absolutely a labor of love. It's yep. like I'm two hour. I'm like four hours into this solo that I thought was going to take two hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, after painting that uh, Winter Guard, the sec- the Winter Guard Rifle Corps with the, uh, or no, it was the um, Winter Guard Infantry, and it's like, oh, and you got all the weapon attachments and the command attachment, and it's just like. That's a lot of dudes that all look the same. <laughs> so I started here back at the end of December, and within the first six months, I had painted an entire 75-point Winter Guard list with over 50 Winter Guard infantry models. And uh, I'm about done with that. <laughs> it is time to move on. Oh, uh, yep. Oh, man. Okay, so we're... Coming down here on the leg. Um, and okay, come down a little bit on the camera. Oh, sorry. There you go. Too and much, too much, too much. Split the difference. Too much. <laughs> I'm just, what I need like those uh, those airport, I don't even, what, you can the wave glowing them in. wands. I can just wave them in silently. Yeah, but I'm focusing on this and uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd see you. So just coming down the leg here. Again, I've got uh, some more of that cloth pattern, cloth leather going on in their pants. So I can just kind of blend this in. So they're not really going to see a whole lot for it. For those of you who haven't seen this unit put together, these are another set of models that's good for a wide range oh, of games yeah. and fantasy games and adventure games. Oh, yeah. Games. Like, uh, here, we'll just... Yep, Hat Guy's my favorite because he guy. reminds me of Red Mage, and I love me some Red Mage. Yeah. He also reminds me of Solomon Cain, who we just made. Yep. Just... Uh, that rough fit. In yeah, they, there. There the we go. order of illumination models have a very, very solid Very witch Kane hunter. Feel. Witch hunter, yeah. Yeah, like that Van guy right Helsing there. Van Helsing feel yes, to them. Those crossbows, that's what that reminds me of. Yeah. yeah, he is just so good. And actually, while I'm looking at this model, I, I love the way that we did this joint here. Um, it just fits in there so nicely, just the, the way that we got the handle of the sword. Um, that goes right and sockets into the scabbard there, which is also connected to the back end of the crossbow. It That's just actually creates. super creative. I thought that was like an arm or something while I was pulling the parts. Oh, yeah. When <laughs> I was first looking at it, I'm like, what is that little it's dog so long. off the back of the crossbow? Is that like a lever or something? So no, it's very cool. You were talking about uh, potentially pinning some of these models during yes. this episode. Yeah. Um, well, is that, is that even going to be necessary? Uh, honestly, no. Um, just because this point of contact here. We're going to look at this guy here. This is the one that I was thinking about pinning just for the sake of a demo. But um, Bring it down a little, little more. Yeah. But uh, the point of contact here is this entire area, the back end of the uh, sword handle, um, his arm going into the arm socket there, 
and like all back here is just all point of contact, he is rock solid. He is not really going to do it. When I first uh, like dry fit him together, and that's actually something I really strongly recommend before you do any sort of gluing, is just really dry fit everything. Just fit it together, have a good look at it, see what it looks like, see if there's anything that like, oh, there's a bit of a gap here. I'm going to fill that before I do anything major. Um, what I like to do in particular is I'll sometimes take some putty and just stick it into a joint and then dry fit it on there and then pull it away and then it'll create like a perfect casting effectively of that joint. Okay. The same thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have any putty right here handy because I didn't think about doing that. It's also a good way to effectively help seal any gap that's going to be in that joint right off the bat because it's already going to be there for you to work with. All right. So speaking of pinning, we are going to go take uh, go do this other guy, uh, the guy with the hood. Um, he's got a little bit less point of contact. He's got just the little uh, socket there and the socket on his other arm for his crossbow. So what I'm going to do is we got a whole bunch of different sizes of pins. I'll try and spread those out a bit. Yeah, a whole bunch of different sizes of pins. And we are going to do a quick little pin job. Now, what I like to use for pins here, um, some people say brass rods. Those are kind of expensive and a little more annoying to find. Just go to your uh, hobby or to office supply store and get a pack of staples. Oh, man, you probably just do that at uh, whatever desk you have in your there house you or go. find some uh, or, or mailed just, documentation you don't need anymore and yeah, pull one just, out of there. It, you can find them anywhere. If And this, honestly, the staples, they work great for uh, any of the really small stuff that you normally want to pin. For example, like the uh, Tharn Blood Trackers, those ones there are one of my like little Bane projects that I used to work on Yeah. because they've got such tiny, dainty little uh, joints. Okay. That, oh, like the, just their shoulder sockets and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, and it's the big, long javelins that they're holding. It's just they need like they needed to be pinned as far as I was concerned. So those ones I definitely did pin. Okay. Uh, where's my proper pin base? So, uh, I mean, like, so because to me a staple is, is a very... Uh, like a you know a delicate piece of of wire like it's very bendy and mm -hmm. and things like is it I mean it's enough to hold that piece in even just yeah uh, because what you're doing when you're pinning something um, is all you're doing is just creating like extra surface area and it's not meant to like they're not really having to support major amounts of weight or anything all it's doing is just creating more surface area and like having your socket being a little bit deeper than it would would normally be. Okay. Um, it's something that we wouldn't be able to do on the miniature when we're engineering it because if we were to make the joints too deep, um, the rubber in the molds would have to go into that really deep socket and you'd get like one good casting before that little nub rips out and okay. it's suddenly so, filled up. So it's technically possible to cast it that way. It's just Tech not great for... Reproducing yeah, and reusing like, molds. No way we'd be able to mass produce something right. like that. Yeah, one of the things. Oh, I lost my pin. Uh, one of the things, like I've always said about casting and always believed, is it's totally possible to cast anything. Like if we really, really, really wanted, we could probably do like a one-piece colossal, like any of the colossals. We could probably do it. Would, but would we ever be able to make any more than like one or two castings of them? Not no, like molds wouldn't last. There'd be no way. Yeah, like there's no way that they'd be feasible to do. So what I'm doing here is finally got that in there. And then you wouldn't have models to assemble. They'd just be statues. Yeah. Uh, Some people might like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I got my new statue today. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just take this and I'll just kind of like set it right down into the bottom deepest part of the socket. Can you, uh, I know it's going to be hard for you, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. Now we get it. Now what I'm doing see. with this hand is putting the pressure on the back side of it and a pin vise, if anybody's new to this, it's kind of got this little swivel on the back that it's meant for putting 
anchor pressure there. And then you're taking your fingers and doing like the little rotation of it here. So what I'm going to do is put that in there and kind of factoring in where the angle of the joint is going. So that the joint is actually going kind of like that. So as I'm doing that, I'm just putting like a light little presser, pressure here and drilling it out. So I'm really good at this point about going too deep and popping my tip out the other side of the miniature. Well, that just means you're going to have a really strong joint. <laughs> <laughs> there were, we, we did have a couple of questions here that I, that I wanted to get to. Um, so Morse127 asks, uh, what's the most important tool for cleaning up your models? And if I understand what he's oh. asking, then I would just rephrase it. If you could only have one tool for cleaning models, which one would it be? That guy. Yep, knife. Like, with, with specifically that blade, right? Yeah, specifically the rounded tip blade. I think this is a 15C or 15 uh, will work. Um, I swear by these blades. I am not a real big fan of these 11 blades, the standard one that comes with whenever you buy the packs of them. Um, they're really good for just kind of like a straight flat surfaces or anything like that. But if you ever need to get into a little nook or a cranny or um, do anything with the tip of it, that tip just likes to dig in and bounce around. It creates like little, it's called chatter, uh, where the vibration from the tool when you're scraping, it uh, has like little chatter marks where the blade is bouncing along gotcha, the miniature. Okay. Yeah, like a goose's teeth. Yeah. Yep. Oh, those, those geese. Yep. Or you could be trouble a, for no reason. You'd be a crow magnum like me and use a utility knife. <laughs> oh, there, there was a time back when I was in middle school just getting into miniature gaming. I didn't have any of the fancy tools or anything. And my first miniatures, I, paint, uh, I cleaned them with a, the file that comes off on the uh, nail clippers. Hmm. So that little thing. I oh, no. Oh, it was so... It was, hideous and I painted it because I didn't even have a uh, paintbrush. I didn't prime it. Oh geez. Uh, globbed super glue in there like you wouldn't believe. It was a mess and I painted it with a toothpick. <laughs> That's impressive. Oh it was yeah it, it was Might as well something. Just dunk it in a bucket of house paint. Oh uh, uh, yeah well I kept that and found <laughs> like I ended up finding it in a drawer like 15 years later or something like that. And it Put was it in a like, glass case. Wow. <laughs> We're just going to keep that and hide it. <laughs> All right. So we got. Oh, we do have a. We have another question, and I apologize. I'm about to butcher your name, but Anders Kurpinski uh, wants to know what you think of joining the parts with green stuff and super glue, like taking a small bottle of green, green stuff, adding super glue, and holding the parts together while the glue cures. Uh, yeah, actually. Um, I ended up doing something like that for an original that broke just the other day. <laughs> um, and we ended up having to pin it, put some putty in it to reinforce the joint, and use super glue just as the quick, like, tack it kind of a thing. So it was like just a really tiny, tiny bit of super glue in the pin just to hold it, uh, coating the other side of the joint in putty, and then putting it all together and then um, putting it under a heat lamp to, to cure. cure it faster. And that's actually something um, that I find a lot of people don't really realize is that you can use that uh, the putties that you use are heat sensitive. Uh, so if you really want to slow down the curing process, like if you've got a, something that you're working on and you really want to like do some sculpting on it and uh, slow down the process so you have more time to work with it, um, cool it off. Like keep it cool. Um, try not to touch it with your fingers so that it uh, takes the body heat away, and it'll cure a lot slower. If you want to, if you're ready and you're finished with it, um, we've got like little empty paint cans that we have that we picked up uh, from the hardware store, and we cut a hole in the side so that you can get in and out, and then put like a little pot lamp over top of it, and it actually works as like a little cure box and. It cures the putty instead of like the brown stuff that we normally will use. Instead of taking like hours and hours and hours to cure, it'll take like 45 minutes on a real good day. Just because, I mean, it just traps all the heat in there yep. and cooks it like a little oven. Yep, yep. And it'll cook rock hard. 
So since nobody has ever mixed up just the right amount of green stuff, there's always <laughs> a little leftover. Always. <laughs> like he was talking about, if you were to take that already mixed green stuff and put it in the freezer, it'll preserve instead of hardening. It'll yeah. remain malleable. I was going to ask yep. you, how, how long uh, will it stay good if you, if you put it in a freezer? I'm not sure. Yeah, I've never really... I mean, could, it would, yeah. is it like next day? I'm not that frugal, so if I have leftover <laughs> yeah. green stuff, I usually just chuck it. Yeah, but. what I end up usually doing is I'll have like a little ball of putty afterwards, and I'll actually stick it in the cure box with uh, whatever I'm working on, because that way it'll actually, like, rather than go and poke my project that I've been working on for hours and hours to get perfectly smooth, mm. I'll uh, go and, like, grab the little ball of excess putty and then test to see if that's actually good and ready. All right, so I've uh, drilled all that little hole there. Um, where did my tool go? There it is. Now, if you take a look at the uh, tip here. Am I? Yep, there we go. Uh, if you take a look at the very tip, we can just see how deep I've gone. You don't need to go super, super deep. So only about that, that far. Not real far, but should be good enough. And then what I'm going to do is take my staple. I've got some super glue ready to go here. Now again, um, I've just got like a little reservoir container. Anything will work, a sheet of plastic, um, yogurt container lid, sheet of wax soda, paper. Soda can lid, yep, like a little can. soda can screw top. Yep, anything at all. And I just pour some super glue into that. I never take it directly out of the container because it just creates this giant globby mess. And then I've got like just a little pointer, metal tool, uh, paper clip will work, toothpick, whatever, and just take the tiniest little amount there, and where'd my paper clip go? You should always, always use an applicator when you're using super glue. Always. Yeah, and just, always. And because yours is a dental tool, I want to point out what I think is happening is that is dedicated for applying glue. That's yeah. not your regular cleaner. This, yeah, no, this is my... This is my super glue applicator probe. I don't use it for anything else because, uh, as you can see, like the super glue kind of like builds up on the end, yeah. and then over time it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually I'll just have to like crack it off with a hammer or some pliers or something like that. One of my number one miniatures tools is a cup of toothpicks on my desk, and I use those as applicators yeah. very frequently. Yeah. Uh, so just put a little bit of super glue on the end there. We're gonna. Socket that into that hole that I got. Look at that beautiful fit. It's looking like if you didn't want to put the actual arm on, you could just make it bionic right here. Just clip off the hand at the wrist well, and add it to that. Give him a hook hand. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I've actually done... Uh, That's how he fires his crossbow so accurately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually done a few uh, things where you end up like... Like I broke the foot off of a model once. Um, it just chipped off as I was going and doing my thing. Um, some of the material we use is really brittle uh, for the originals. And I ended up having to redo the whole foot by creating like a little armature and then just re-sculpting the foot. Wow. Like It was the bottom of a shoe, so it's nothing So you effectively detailed, made like a wireframe skeleton and sculpted the foot around that? Yeah, exactly. So, and did you pin that... Uh, pin that Rod in, what you did it on? Uh, with well, your little skeleton? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind uh, of. Striker911 here is asking what the worst repair you've ever had to make to a model is. Um, well, the... Uh, worst, worst as in most difficult or worst as in the worst job Brian's ever done? Oh. Brian's never done a bad job. <laughs> <so> <laughs> that's a trick question. I, I don't give up <laughs> until it's done right. <laughs> No, uh, probably that uh, that tassel that broke off yesterday was one of the oh, things that, that gave bad, me the huh? biggest fits because it had broken off several times uh, just over the process of it. It's just like I'd pass it off to the next process and they'd be ready to go with it. And it's like somebody would come back. It's like, I'm sorry, Brian, we broke it broke again. It's like, oh, come on. Yeah, you'd be <laughs> You're like, killing me. you kick him into the pit like Leonidas. <laughs> 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 All right. So we got the pin there, it's set, it's bring, ready to go. Bring it down a bit. Yep, yep, ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is now we gotta drill a hole on this other side that's gonna be about the same. Yeah. Uh, now, anybody who's ever tried this, 
they've got this rounded edge. Trying to get a drill bit to dig in at that exact point is a pain. So what I like to do is I'll actually just cut off a chunk of the key so I have a nice flat spot that I can set that, that pin. Is this effectively like the rounded or the male end of the parts that you're putting together? Yep, yep. So then I'll just do this and slowly get that set. You just created a flat spot for you to drill into? Yep. So okay. it's not, yeah, because it'll skip off if it has that rounded. Yeah, if you have the rounded point, area, yeah. it'll slide off the end of the ball I've exactly where you want that pin. Poked many a finger with a drill bit trying to uh, pin into places that, that weren't very flat. I also want to point out, like, um, thanks for saying that, like, you don't have to dig to the center of the earth when making your pin. That it no, just... no. Like, uh... <laughs> One of the things is like, what are, we, what are we realistically using these miniatures for? It is not for smashing them on the ground. Yeah, I have no more fight. Yeah, I don't have <laughs> intentions of throwing them at people or you know, walls for fun or whatever. Um, I'm not putting them under you know, stacks of books. Like, they're not bookends or anything like that. Um, I don't really intend on throwing, like dropping them off tables or anything. The worst thing that's going to happen for me is I'm going to chip paint off of them before mm -hmm. any real stress is going to be happening on joints. Um, so I rarely actually pin my miniatures unless they're the really super tiny fiddly bits, because um, I, I treat them. I try to treat them well enough that they're not going to uh, get destroyed at all. I'll effectively, I guess it would still technically be pinning, but more or less dowel like really heavy parts sometimes. I yeah. use toothpicks for that fairly often. Yeah, uh, a lot of the times also, like I find that even just uh, scraping the points out or the connection points out a little bit so that it's roughing it up. Um, just getting a cleaner fit. Yeah, just scratching up the area a little bit just gives it a little bit more tooth. It's kind of like your primer uh, when you're painting miniatures and stuff. It's just giving it some bite for the super glue to hang on to and just increasing the surface area of the joint. And that usually is good enough. <laughs> this guy, wait till your first kid gets a hold of a model and tries to play. Yeah, uh, I bet. Yeah, someone asked earlier what was the most. He was he was at what was the most heartbreaking break? And I don't know that the breaks are heartbreaking, but pretty much any time one of my kids handles one of my models, it ends in me just like in a defeated head down <laughs> sigh, <laughs> just like. <sighs> okay, that uh, happened. That all right. And that's yep. how Jordan we feels when you drop happen. something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I don't really have, I don't have kids, so I, I yep. and even if I did, it'd be like, nope. Wait till a ferret eats your miniatures. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't you put that evil on me. <laughs> no, they will, they will run off with those, and they will just be stashed underneath everything. Yeah. And they'll just be playing, I'll just hear dice rolling, and it's like, what are they doing? <laughs> My cat ran off with a buddy of mine's uh, Cyclops. He grabbed him right by the banner and ran off the counter with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if my ferrets ever somehow got my miniatures, it would be very much a, why did I leave them two feet from the ground? Yeah, <laughs> I asked for this. <laughs> Let's give a shout out to some of the guys we see watching every single stream, like Striker911 and Alec Luda. Some yeah, of these guys they're here every, always every stream, us. every week, every day. Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, that just popped out. All right, we're going to put in a new one. Uh, Xeno666, do you use kicker and accelerator when gluing your models together? Sometimes. Um, what I find when I'm using the accelerators... Come down a little bit. Yeah, uh, when I'm using the accelerators is it creates a brittle... Like, it does make the super glue, super glue a little bit more brittle, like I'm using some right now. Um, just because I don't really feel like holding it until it's done. Um, what I will often do is, people see me like huffing on my miniatures, like I'll just get it right up to my face and just go <sighs> really hard on it. And uh, I find that the vapor from my breath, more often than not, does a lot of the kicking for me. So I don't really have to use the accelerator. It, but super glue being super glue, it likes to cure on its own time. 
either five seconds or five minutes, whatever it decides that day. Yeah, whatever is the least convenient for you. Like, there is, it is the worst when it's like, okay, I'll just put a little super glue on this side of the joint. We'll go and take the other one. Oh, it's cured already. How? <laughs> so, what I'm doing right now is just kind of got that socket drilled in nice and deep and just kind of dry fading it in to make sure that I've got it lined up properly. Looks like I am still trying to get that angle. Yeah, looks like I've still got a little bit more to go. So what I'm going to do is just trim this side of the pin down a little bit more. And that's just because it was the, you, had, you had a gap once you put the two together. Yep. It's not staying in. Why does this keep falling out? It's probably not staying in because we need five more Twitch subscribers. To <laughs> Make it happen. Wow. Almost certain that's what it is. Yeah, okay. We need five more just to be able to do this demo properly. And of course, oh, there it is. Some of the worst is uh, when I'm doing like layup work or anything like that, spending all this time create, like building this perfect little joint and then you go to clip something and the whole joint or the thing that I've been working on just goes Poo! and shoots off like a <laughs> rocket and it's like, well, it's gone. Let's just start over. I dropped a berserker shoulder spike on the floor of my miniatures area a few weeks ago and I'm just waiting to step on that thing and take D4 damage. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I see what <laughs> reference you made there. Okay, so we are running up at the 11 o'clock mark, but we're going to run long so you can get this, these right. arms pinned on there. All right. Ah, yeah, okay. So we are good there. I did. Yeah. I was thinking about cutting the stream right after you were like, oh, this is a problem. And then like, and eh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, so we'll put a little bit on there and there. A little bit of glue. And get try and get it on camera. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you yep, go. Yep. And there we go. And a little bit of accelerant in here. Again, I don't. I really wouldn't prefer using this just because it's makes things a little bit more brittle. But there we go. Now, of course, I didn't actually clean this guy properly because I would much prefer to go over like this entire hood area and clean the crossbow individually. I'll go through and do all the cleaning on the parts before doing it, dry fit them, all that fun stuff. But I want to do a nice little example of that pin, and that is nice and super snug. Moore's 127 sounds like an infernalist to me. <laughs> is that someone we know? <laughs> he said, is that an order of illumination jerk? Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it totally is. He's, he's coming at you with that crossbow. Yep. Somebody's got to shoot those howlers. Oh, those howlers. They look so good. They do. Oh, they do. If you gosh. haven't seen the ones that uh, have actually, have those been shown off yet? The ones that Jordan finished up? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. We yeah. showed off a, a sneaky preview image on um, yesterday's Get Your Paint On stream in the, in the preview slides and the post slides. So you can go back and watch that episode, uh, I believe, at the end. And uh, I, I'm guessing somebody screen grabbed them somewhere. So you might, no, have, you might have to dig, but they're out there. Yeah. Um, so, also, just real quick, we got this one here. We're just going to do a real quick glue job of this just so you can see the mostly finished model. A little bit of super glue on there. Again, I would norm like this one here is just tinted so it would show up on screen a little bit better. Um, if I were ever to do this for whatever silly reason, uh, when I'm actually working on the model for my own project, uh, I would use a little bit of alcohol bath afterwards. Look at that. Like, that is one super dynamic model. I, this, is, this is one of my favorite models. I saw these guys when they were first coming through in the digital phase. Uh, wow. the, first, the sculpts were first coming out, and I was like, that's a cool model. That looks great. And she's got a... Uh, Eh, we'll do this real quick, too. As much of a pain as it can be to produce models that have a lot of finger detail like she does, they are very satisfying. Oh, fingers. I really liked the uh, 
the Grey Lord adjunct, the Kung Fu Grey Lord, with his hand posing was very cool. Yeah. We were looking at the uh, originals for the Trancer Dancer, not the originals, the masters for the Trancer Dancer this morning, and she has some really cool stuff going on with her hands as well. Yeah. That's going to make my life super hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I freaking love this model. It is so cool. And again, the Vigilance these, are very yeah, cool Yeah, these as well. are the Order of Illumination Vigilance. Oh, just the whole Order of Illumination. Like, um, I did all the physical work on uh, the Grand Master. Gabriel Throne? Yeah, or yeah. Or Thorn, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, he looks so cool on that horse. That is a really good cab unit. I would really love to see a diorama of him and Valen Hawk charging each other. I think that would be very oh, rad. Oh, yeah. Oh, get on it. <laughs> oh, now it's my job? Yeah, okay. you, yeah you're... you're <laughs> You suggested it. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for uh, tuning in today. And thank you so, so much for all of you subscribers. Uh, we appreciate all that you do and you continuing to support the stream. Um, if you have any conversions, kit bashes, uh, painted models, post those, photo, uh, those models and use the hashtags P3 Painters, P3 Kit Bashers on Instagram. Uh, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Tanner, you got to say goodbye, too. Bye, everybody. <laughs>